grab on to the latest trend in uh, Christian theology. You maybe watch a show on television. Perhaps you uh, go to a big church or even a small church somewhere and uh, the minister speaks or someone speaks and they share you this great revelation that is um, often true but out of balance. And it's easy to get drawn into that, that our whole life becomes consumed with one thing. You know, I was thinking about I was thinking about the thief on the cross. You know, I'm just going to read the passage a little bit so we can re rethink about what happened. And I'm reading from Luke 23, 39. And it said, one of the malefactors which were hanged uh, railed on Jesus saying, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. Um, talk about a selfish prayer. He really wasn't interested in saving Jesus. He just said, any way I could get down off of this cross, even though I deserve to be here, even though I've either been a, a robber or murderer or something, and I deserve to be here, uh, you know, my, my last sort of dash hope is I would get this Jesus guy to really be something that he can get me down off the cross. It's interesting. That's what the one thief on the cross said. If you're really the Christ, save yourself and us with you. But the other, the other one answered and rebuked him saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done, done nothing amiss. So there they are on the cross, the three of them. You know, it's kind of like when there's these intimate moments when you're in uh, events that other people are watching from a distance. It happens in funeral services, it happens in wedding services, and there's stuff going on at the front that nobody else in the room is aware of but whoever's up there. There's a, a discussion about sometimes important stuff, and that's what's happening. Jesus is dying on the cross for the sins of the world, and there's a man on each side of him that are, are also being crucified, but because they've committed crimes, because they've done awful things. And the one, of course, wants to be saved. Jesus, if you're really who you say you are, save yourself and us. But the other one says to him, you know, even in death, even at this moment of dying, you don't fear God. Seeing that we're all going to die here together. Like, that's kind of the time to be honest and open about the realities of things. We indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, Remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. Jesus, it's amazing. Jesus, even in those moments, he's, think about it. You're, you're dying on the cross and you're still, you're still not only saving the world, but you're ministering, in a sense, to the man next to you. The one guy has a repentant attitude. He recognizes what he's done wrong. The other guy wants to just carry on doing what he's done. And Jesus says to him, Verily I say unto you, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I, I love that because for, for all the doubters in the world who say, well, when you die, you die. Well, where's Jesus going later on today if he's just going to die? Where's the thief on the cross if he's going to be with Jesus somewhere? Where are they meeting up? Well, you know they're going to take their bodies. You're going to stick them in a the grave somewhere. He's not talking about his body. There's something going on here that, that the, the people who look at things superficially don't see. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. How awesome is that? That I always wonder though, if for some reason they had stayed the execution of that guy and he had got to live, what would he have been like? How would he have been transformed by this encounter with Jesus on the cross? Would he have been transformed? We've been talking a bit about different stories in the Bible because I think it's important that you go over them, Old Testament, New Testament. All scriptures given by inspiration of God. The Bible talks about how it's profitable for us. Um, you're not supposed to copy it necessarily, but you're supposed to learn from it. You're supposed to observe it and see based on where we live and how we live today. How does that apply to me? How can I use what we learned in that scripture? How can I grow from that? Everything that's in there is profitable for your growth, your development, your spiritual discernment. That's what it's there for. That's why it's inspired by God. Think about that. You know, um, every name that's in there, and I go through there, you, there's whole passages of things that are just names of people. But every one of those names, for some reason, God chose that we would get to discover that person's name and who their descendants were and all about them for our growth, for his edification. How awesome is that? But, you know, we come to that story, and, and it's about uh, the Gadarean demoniac. And I'm reading from Luke 8. 
I'll pick it up at verse um, 26. And they arrived at the country of the Gadareans, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils for a long time and wore no clothes. He didn't live in a house, but he lived in the tombs. I've met that same guy downtown, Hamilton here, I'm sure, a couple times. Same guy. Like, well, not the guy, but the demons that were in the same guy. Because they live forever, and uh, they haven't stopped doing what they're doing. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils a long time, wore no clothes, neither lived in a house, but in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him with a loud voice, said, What have I to do with Jesus, you, thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? Now here we go. Here's a testimony from uh, uh, the, one of the, well, many of the demons that are troubling everybody in the world. And he says, What have I have to do with thee, Jesus, the Son of God? Son of God, most high. All the people don't recognize Jesus for who he is, but the demons recognize him. Right away, there he is. Jesus, the Son of God. I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oftentimes it had caught him, and when he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he broke the bands and was driven out of the devil out into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? If you're, if you're up for it, when you're walking around downtown and one of them comes up to you and waves their thing or yells and screams or does their weirdo thing, ask them, what's your name, by the way, buddy? What's your name? Oh, I am Legion, for we are many. Yeah. Right? We don't have any sympathy for the demon, but we should have some compassion for the man that is controlled by them. Or the woman. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain, and they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. And he suffered them, and, and then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. And when they that had fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils was departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Now today what we want to talk about is true faith in God, the true Christian walk, is about sitting at the feet of Jesus. It isn't about going to church, although if we're following Jesus, we are going to go somewhere to gather with the believers. It isn't about running around, ministering to the poor, and uh, trying to find housing for people, although we will do that um, because we're motivated by Jesus' love, but that isn't what it is. And so it's easy to get caught up in the the outward manifestation and miss out on the realities of what's important. This man was transformed from uh, controlled by thousands of demons in a moment of time. And when he's transformed, where do we find him? It says, and they found him, the man out of whom the, evil, the devils had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And he was clothed and he was in his right mind. And that made them afraid. That made them very afraid. Because this was different. This was different than going to a meeting where someone's talking at the front. And you go, oh yeah, that's true, or whatever, you know. It, it, this isn't taking something you want, you, you want to do in your life and trying to make it be justifiable to the world by stamping a, a Jesus sticker on the side of it. You know, well, gee, I want to go to the Bahamas. Well, I'm going to plan a little mission trip down there, and I'm going to stick a Jesus sticker on my luggage, and I'm going to tell everybody I'm going to the Bahamas, and I'm going to share the gospel with people, and all you really do is lay on the beach, and the odd person that comes by and says, hey, God loves you, man. God loves you, you know? And, 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 and so we take the life that we want to live, and we try to squeeze Jesus into it so we can justify it as being, I'm really a devoted disciple of Jesus. I'm sure um, 
if we ran into a situation like they ran into with this demoniac and how he was transformed, they would see this was something different than that, much different than that. In Luke 10, it says, Luke 10, 38, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Don't you care that I have to do all this stuff that I'm doing by myself? I thought these other people were believers too. What's wrong with them? Feel that way sometimes? And Jesus answered and said, Well, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. You're all worked up about stuff. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Now, if you're a person who's addicted to doing stuff, that's not the message you wanted to hear from Jesus. You wanted to hear him say, Get those people out there doing something. Now, we don't need more people out there doing something just so they can stick a Jesus sticker on it and say, I'm doing something for God. We need people to be transformed by spending time at the feet of Jesus. Right? She had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. She was like a sponge. She was sucking in absorbing the truth that Jesus taught. And so because of that, she had left her sister to do all the housework. Doesn't seem very fair, does it? There's a story in the Bible, I don't have it right here in front of me, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a recap of that. You know, there was a man who was sick and, and they were going to take him to Jesus and they got there or they looked at the house and it was all full of people. It was full of people. So they, so they took his bed they took his bed and they climbed up on the roof and they cut open the roof and they lowered him down into the room in front of Jesus and Jesus healed him. Now, how would you like to be the guy whose roof that was? How excited were you about that? I never thought of that. Right? It's like, uh, it's like you put a Jesus sticker on your car and you drive down the road and you get down the road there and you pull up to stop at a light and all of a sudden somebody pulls up behind you and honks the horn. Your bumper sticker says, Honk if you love Jesus. And the guy behind you pulls up behind you and he honks the horn. And you look up and the light's red and you get out and you go, What's the matter with you? Can't you see the light's red? And the guy's going and he's pointing at your sticker. Honk if you love Jesus, man. Honk if you love Jesus. You see, if you're going to put the sticker on there, live up to it. Don't stick the sticker on there thinking that that makes it all good. Stickers are good. I remember when I first decided I wanted to go out and do some sort of meeting with people to share the gospel with Jesus, you know, that I had an old black meteor and I had a couple of bumper stickers on it. But one I remember in particular, it said, wise men still seek him. Now this, this, this sounds totally, our world is so different today than it was then because that car used to sit in front of Tim Hortons in Dundas Whenever I, whenever I was in town, whenever I wasn't at work or at home, I would sit in front of that Tim Hortons. And there was a sign there that said, no loitering, 20 minute time limit, sign there. And cars would come and people would be standing around there talking and all of a sudden the police would come and they'd chase them all the way, but my car would be sitting there. And finally people would go to them and say to Tim Hortons, and what, why is that guy's car here? Like, it's been here all day. Nobody's... And they said, well, because we know what he's doing. There was two policemen in town. We used to call them Starsky and Hutch. They had the unmarked car. They were the drug guys. They'd drive around trying to find kids doing stuff wrong and that. And, and they would say, that car gets to stay there. And the honest truth, as, as weird as this sounds, not that I'm some important person or anything, that the girls at Tim Hortons would take messages for me. People would call there and they'd say, hi, is, is Tim there? And they'd say, no, but... Well, who is it calling him? We'll get him, get him a message because he'll be back here soon. His car's still here. And I would get messages from the girls behind the counter to set up times for me to meet with people. And we'd go in and have a coffee and talk about the gospel or whatever. How times have changed. Bumper stickers can be good. But you got to be living up to it. So 
Six days before the Passover came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, and whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was out. Uh, Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. So you have the same story. We're back with Lazarus and Martha, and Lazarus is sitting there with everybody telling the story about how great it was that Jesus had raised him from the dead. And we just imagine how great a story. Gee, Lazarus, tell me again, what was it like being dead? Can't you, wouldn't that be the first question to ask him? Like, tell me, what's it like being dead? How amazing was that? What, what, when, when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, and, you, and you, you just came out with all the stuff on. I mean, you've been dead for four days. How cool is that? And he's, you know, they're sitting around talking, and, and Martha's doing what she was doing in the passage before, still serving everybody at the table. And it says, And then took Mary a pound of ointment of spirit, Spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, the one who was going to betray Jesus, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? There you go. There you go. There you go. That's all he could see. Some excuse to justify getting close to the money. You shouldn't be spending all that money, wasting that money on Jesus' feet. There's poor people in town that need it. Well, you know what? If you don't put Jesus first, the rest of it's useless. The rest of it's useless. He only said this because he didn't care for the poor, because, but because he was a thief and he had the bag and he was responsible for the money that was put therein. And then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my burying has she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you don't always have with you. There it goes. If we're gonna, if we're gonna do anything, going to come from being at the feet of Jesus. Now there was a lot of Jewish people there, therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom they had heard he was raised from the dead. And the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death again, because by reason of his resurrection, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. How sick do you have to be that you want to kill a guy that was dead and raised from the dead again because people saw it and believed in Jesus? And that's more important. We get so caught up in our ideology sometimes that that becomes more important than the truth. That becomes more important than God. That becomes more important than anything. I think it's interesting that it was the feet of Jesus. Right? <clears throat> because it's about this humbling ourselves. You know, when you when you read in scripture and you say that they come in contact with God or that that they that they bow down before him. I know you've gone to the charismatic churches where everybody falls backwards. That's really not what it's about. In, um, I've searched scripture. I can never find a place in scripture where someone who was serving God fell backwards before God. We know in, when Jesus is in the garden and they came to arrest him and he says, whom do you seek? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. And it says immediately they fell backwards onto the ground. Yes, and they, they experienced the power of God, but not in a submissive way, in anything but a submissive way. But always a sign of submission. And I've been to the meeting, so don't give me a hard time about having said that. Um, Humbling ourselves is always coming before God and bowing down before Him. First Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourself therefore out of the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. It really means just coming before Him and saying, I have all kinds of ideas, God, about how I can serve you, but what I really want is your idea about how I can serve you. A lot of people tell me a lot of things, but what I really want is you to tell me what you want me to do.
And it's a great story because all of these stories are great because as you read them, the thing that's most significant about it is the disciples always missed it. Even when they saw it, they missed it. I mean, here's Jesus saying about Mary that she's done this for my burial. And still they missed it, that he was going to die. He told them over and over again, I'm going to be crucified, and I'm going to die and be buried, and I'm going to rise again. And they still missed it. And in our midst, there are people, I don't necessarily mean this room, but in our midst of Christian people, there are people who, who love the idea about doing something good for people because, for whatever reason, there's lots of reasons. One is that it makes you look good before other people. It, it eases your conscience about how much money you have or how you live differently than everybody else. But usually it's not because they're out there because they, it's what God told them to do. Because they don't believe in the Jesus we're talking about. I know Christian pastors that have been pastors of churches for years, and when you go and you talk to them, well, I don't really believe that actually all happened. That's just a good story. I'm thinking, like, hello, why don't you go do something else? Like, if you're not, if you don't really believe in the story, why do you call yourself a Christian? Why don't you call yourself, I'm a do-gooder. I'm a do-gooder. I just believe in doing good to people. Go do that. I don't have a problem with that. But stop wearing the I love Jesus sticker. You don't love Jesus. You love a lot of other things, but you don't love Jesus. James 4 and 1 says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not from hence even of the, your lusts that war in your members? You lust and you have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not, and you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you might consume it upon your own lusts. God, I want a worldwide ministry. Why? Well, because then I can drive around in a limousine and fly in a jet. No, that's not what it's about. If God does that to you, you don't even want it. It's about serving Jesus. I want you to think about why would these guys, who all the whole time the story's unfolding, the disciples, they, they didn't get the message, and they were afraid to go out um, after the crucifixion of Jesus, because they're afraid they were going to get arrested and get crucified too. But after the coming of the Holy Spirit, every single one of them except one was crucified or killed for the cause of Christ. Men that were afraid to do anything. And all of a sudden, they went all over the world to preach the gospel knowing that they would die for it. Peter, the chicken-hearted one, so many times, didn't, didn't refuse to be crucified. He said, but I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord crucified me upside down. And the only one that wasn't killed was John the Beloved. We know he wasn't killed, but he was thrown into a vat of boiling oil at one point and survived for the cause of Christ. How'd you like that? Call you Mr. French Fry. What changed them? The Bible tells us, it says, when they perceived that they were ignorant and unlearned, unlearned men, they took note of them that they had been with Jesus. You ask and receive not because you ask and miss that you might consume upon your own lust. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit which dwelleth within us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. It's not about being mighty for God. It's about being humble and broken before him. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. That's the song we sing. Do we believe that? At the feet of Jesus. We were thinking about the wedding feast in Cana. Oh, I was talking to somebody about it. We were thinking about it. 
In that story, it's interesting because Jesus is invited to a wedding. Jesus isn't officiating the wedding, in case you're thinking that he had married somebody he didn't. Um, Jesus is invited to the wedding, and, he, and he's sort of compelled to go in the sense that when you have these commitments to people and you're invited, you go. And so Jesus and the disciples go to the wedding. I always think it's great. People think, well, what did Jesus do at the wedding? He made the wine, right? I mean, Jesus was different than what we think. And it says that after they had gone through the feast, the man who was running the feast came to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and said, I don't know what we're going to do. He says, uh, the party's still going, but we're running out of wine. We have a problem. And of course, if you're a Baptist, you'd say, well, they shouldn't have been drinking wine anyway. That's their problem. Um, of course, that's not what the Bible says, but anyway. Um, and so Mary right away goes and gets Jesus. Jesus, you know, mom, mom's calling Jesus. Jesus, where are you? He goes, yes, what's the problem? She says, um, just you tell these people what to do. Um, they, they, they're out of wine. And he goes, uh, mom, my time hasn't come yet. Just you tell them what to do. They're running out of wine. And that's the last we hear of Mary. She just sort of disappears. Like she, she just puts absolute trust in that Jesus is going to do something. And Jesus says, okay. So he says uh, to the servant, he says, I want you to go over there. You know the big clay pots we have at the door? You know the, you know the ones where we draw water out to wash people's feet when they come in? Yeah, I know where those are. I want you to reach there into that. Just take the dipper and reach in there and take it to the master of ceremonies for the feast and tell him that Jesus sends it over there. So it's, I'm, I'm sure the servant's going, okay, we're running out of wine. Jesus has me dip in the dipper in the water we use for washing feet. And he takes it to the master of ceremonies. And the master of ceremonies is there and he tastes it. He goes, I am amazed. He says, most people serve the good wine first, you know. And then when people are had enough to drink and they can't really tell the difference between good wine and bad wine, then you bring out the bad wine. But he says, you, you've saved the really good wine till now. And so they took that water and they served it to the guests. And that was the greatest wine that a wedding ceremony has ever had. That's the Jesus we're talking about. At the feet of Jesus, the Gadarean, one moment he's possessed. Today, maybe you're possessed. I don't know. Are you? Maybe you're not possessed. Maybe you're just controlled by desires that you can't be free from. Or maybe you are become complacent in, in walking with God. Or maybe you've got challenges that you've prayed for for a long time that haven't been answered. Or a whole bunch of things. Whatever. <coughs> We can't do magic here. We don't believe in doing magic here. But we do believe in a God who can do anything. Are you willing for him to do anything? Have you come to the point where, it's like so many of these people in the story had come to the end of themselves. You know, nobody asked the Gadarene if he wanted to be set free. But the fact that Jesus was there to set him free tells me that deep inside there was a man in there that wanted to be free. There was a man in there that wanted to be free. Perhaps he cried out, oh God, do something. I, I don't like living like this. Perhaps he said like we have many times, oh God, just do a miracle and I'll serve you with all that I have and all that I am. And then he meets Jesus. All those evil things inside him were worked up. What are you doing here, Jesus? We know who you are. Have you come to torment us? Jesus just said, what is your name? We are legion, for we are many. Okay, you can just go now. Thank you. You can go. You've been dismissed. The King of Kings says, bye bye. You know, no big show. It was a big show, but Jesus didn't have to do it. The big show was the demons going into the herd of swine and then running down the hill and drowning in the water. The big show was the man who had been naked and confused and superhuman strength and had tormented the community was dressed and in his right mind and sitting down at the feet of Jesus.
Isn't that what we want? Humble ourselves. What have you got you don't want Jesus to take? Somebody in my family once was afraid to become a Christian because they were afraid that he was going to make them be a missionary and go somewhere they didn't want to go. Deep inside you maybe have that kind of fear. Don't, I don't want to serve you like that, Jesus. I don't want to have to tell my friends about you. <laughs> That's the least of your problems. You might make me do something I don't want to do. I might have to actually go out there and do something. I, I'm comfortable. I, I got all the channels on TV I want. I don't need to go do anything. <laughs> Humble yourself. God, you hear our prayers, right? As we pray. God knows the answer to your problem. And I can tell you this, it's usually never what we think. Someday, a day is coming when we'll be anxious to hear those words from God, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Not, depart from me, you cursed, I never knew you. And I can tell you this, there's going to be a lot of people who went to church every Sunday, who ran ministries, who were interviewed on television shows, and were influential people who, he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. <laughs> That's just the way it is. And then everybody's going to look at them and say, you know, well, I thought you said you were a Christian, I thought you... The only test is, does Jesus know you? Will he say, will people take note of you and say, I don't know a lot about them, but I know that they may be ignorant, they may be unlearned, but they've been with Jesus. Like Esther, we have been chosen for today. Realize that? I know you don't like that. I wish I was born some other time, but we've been chosen for today. I'm going to close the service in prayer. I'd ask that while I'm praying that whatever is on your heart, whatever is your issue, I mean, I can you can pray, come up and pray with me afterwards if you'd like, but that we would just open our hearts to God and say, God, I don't know. I just really want what you want. God, we come before you and that's what we really want. I know we have lots of ideas about doing this or doing that or not doing this or not doing that. Um, we've read the Bible, we've gone to church, we've done all those things, but what we really want is what you want. What we really want is to experience your presence in our life on a day-to-day -day basis. What we really want is to be in a situation where you call us to do things that make us uncomfortable, but we do it anyway. Because we know it's your will. But because we know it's pleasing to you. God, our desire is to be transformed by the resurrecting power of Jesus' death on the cross and the coming of the Holy Spirit to direct us and empower us and fill us and convict us and, you know, that we would walk in the joy of knowing that we walk with you. And so, God, we commit this place and we commit our lives and our situation to your hands and only you know all the ins and outs, the, the hidden secrets, the unspoken things that are there. We just ask that, God, that you would root those things out of our life, that you'd help us to let go of things that are holding us, that our desire would be to serve you and to walk with you, to serve you and to worship you in spirit and in truth. It's so about as we have today, we don't know if we have tomorrow, but as many days as you give us, that we would use them to bring honor and glory to you in the things that we do. And if there's things that we plan to do that aren't of you, God, we ask that you show us so that we would say, you know what, I'd like to do that, but I'm not going to do that because that's not where God's taking me. Or maybe we 
haven't been doing anything because we haven't heard anything. And we ask then that you would speak to us so we would hear plainly what it is you've called us to do. And as we read the scriptures, as we open the Bible and read it, that the words and direction would come alive and we'd see how it applies to our situation, to our life. That we might be the people of God. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.